This is Mr. Electricity, Steve Regal, and you are listening to the one and only Dave Dynasty Show. The Midwest supporting, bruiser loving, positivity spreading, world's most dangerous podcast. Join former pro wrestler and promoter Dave Dynasty as he supports and promotes Midwest pro wrestling. Keep on growing with the Midwest Express. This is the Dave Dynasty Show. Greetings and welcome to the Dave Dynasty Show. I'm your host, Dave Dynasty. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the free Dave Dynasty Show. That's right. We bring this to you free every week. With lots of great wrestling content uh, from the past. Uh, We touch on a few things from the present, but only the good stuff. Because this is the home of the real wrestling podcast, the Dave Dynasty Show. And by real, I don't mean we're a real podcast, which we are. But, I mean, we discuss real wrestling, right? We We don't bother with any of the joke stuff and the things that you don't like, right? We keep it on the good stuff, which tends to lend to a nostalgic scent most of the time. But that's okay. Uh, but I'm rambling. So uh, anyway, we are free every week, and we can do that by your ongoing contributions. So continue to donate to the Dave Dynasty Show any way you can. You can go to Pro Wrestling Tees slash, or excuse me, Pro Wrestling Tees dot com slash the Dave Dynasty, and buy one of our shirts. We have the Bruiser Buddy shirts, the Show Logo shirt. We have the Ring a Ding Dong Dandy shirt. Lots of great shirts there. Go check it out. Buy one now. Have it shipped to your wrestling fans on your Christmas list. It'll make a great gift. Trust me, you'll be over like Rover if you buy them a Dave Dynasty Show shirt. Um, yeah, I don't know why I said that, but anyway. <laughs> or you can make financial contributions to the show at paypal.me slash the Dave Dynasty. Uh, anything helps. It helps keep the show for free. Everything goes back into the show to pay for our hosting, to pay for our equipment, to pay for promotional stuff, all that. So everything you give goes right back into the show. And we appreciate you doing that. And while you're at it, go out there on all the social medias and give us a follow. Uh, you can look us up at The Dave Dynasty. We're on Twitter at The Dave Dynasty. On Facebook, uh, it's facebook.com slash The Dave Dynasty for our page. You can also look. There's a group, The Dave Dynasty Show Real Dis- uh, Wrestling Discussion Group, which you can discuss anything that is prominent on your mind as far as real pro wrestling. It's a great group. Lots of fun. Go check that out. We're also on Instagram. I am The underscore Dave Dynasty. That's right. Somebody else has The Dave Dynasty on Instagram. And I can't get it, so I'm still fighting the good battle there. But anyway, uh, you go check us out there. And then, of course, on whatever is your favorite podcast platform, we are there. Uh, no matter if it's Spotify, if it's Apple Podcasts, uh, if it's, uh, I don't know, what else, SoundCloud, YouTube, whatever it is, we are there. Just look up Dave Dynasty Show, subscribe to us, and wherever you are, the, give us a rating and a review, and then share. When I put the shows out there, give it a share, help us network. Help us continue the listenership growth that we're experiencing, and we are experiencing it. The the latest shows have been great. The Ring a Ding Dong Dandy Stampede Wrestling episodes we've done have been spectacular. Thank you guys so much for the positive feedback and reviews and listenership of those shows. But everything's going great. You're truly enjoying it, and we are enjoying giving you this content uh, on a regular basis. Today is no different. We got a great show uh, for you today. We have an interview. With the author of the book, The Man of All Talents, The Extraordinary Life of Douglas Clark. Uh, his name is Stephen Bell. You're going to want to hear this. It's a, it's very cool because I know a lot of you are sitting there saying, who's Douglas Clark? Well, Stephen is going to tell you who Douglas Clark is, and you're going to be fascinated by this guy. It is such an, an extraordinary story that you won't believe that you haven't heard before. Uh, and also, make sure you listen all the way through the interview to the very end, which why wouldn't you anyway? But at the very end of the interview... Uh, Stephen tells what his next project is, and it's a very exciting project. I am I am over the moon about this next project and cannot wait to see that. So make sure you give it a listen and find out what Stephen is writing next. So before we dive into that, let's let's go over a couple of housekeeping things and a couple of cleanup uh, headline type things. We do this occasionally. Uh, first of all, let me send a congratulations out there to Zachary Wentz and Desmond Xavier both of who have been signed to contracts and will be debuting for NXT in the future. Uh, I, I've worked both with Zachary and Desmond uh, in my past. I've booked them on shows, worked with them. They are extraordinary talents. I knew this several years ago. I saw these guys. I thought, man, these and surely they do. Uh, you know them as two-thirds of the Rascals from Impact Wrestling. They continue. Their stock continues to rise. I cannot wait to see them on NXT. They're two good dudes, two good talents. 
going to be great to see them there. And I don't know if you've seen this. Goldberg has been teasing a match with Roman Reigns, prefer, probably at WrestleMania. And, you know, I don't know what to think of this. Usually I'm very downtrodden on a Goldberg match. But if Goldberg comes in and he puts Roman over, I'm all for it. Let's do it that way. Let's pass that torch. Let's put Roman over strong in that match. Let's see a Goldberg-like match with, but with Roman going over. How about that? But, you, you know, usually I don't get excited about Goldberg matches. I'm not a Goldberg fan. I, I don't. I don't second guess that you excuse me in the background if you hear my dog barking he's over here attacking a pillow uh, I, anyway I, I don't I don't have any ill will towards Goldberg with wanting to get paid and get money and taking these opportunities whatever just not a Goldberg fan so uh, but we'll see what becomes of that and where they go with that uh, what about Shaq on AEW I haven't seen this yet because I don't watch AEW really but you know Stack and Sting both debuting on AEW and you know I, I, I get it they're trying to get viewers on and it worked right the the episode was here lately the, their numbers have been up the episode was sting you know they're they're actually nipping at the heels of that million viewer mark which is extraordinary um but what like with sting what kind of boggles my mind is they, they're giving all indications that sting is going to be an active wrestler and i'm not sure how that works i know he's got some injuries that that put him on the wwe uh, kind of no fly list so to speak so I'm not sure what they're going to do with that. I don't know whether they're going to. It's going to be some smoke and mirror stuff. I, I don't know. It'll be curious to see what they do with that. Again, I, I think they're missing the boat. I, I get this. You know, some of these guys are help bringing viewers in. I get that, but it's not going to do any good if they're not creating some of their own stars. And I know some of you think they are. They're they're not doing it the right way in my in my estimation, especially with some guys. But we'll see where it goes with that. I want to see and good thoughts out to Jim Valley. A uh, member of the Cauliflower Alley Club, a, a fellow podcaster, a, a historian, a great guy. Uh, you know, had some online conversations with Jim about a few things. Always appreciated all the work he does for professional wrestling and professional wrestling history and for the Cauliflower Alley Club. He's been the CAC radio for a long time. Jim's been battling COVID, and he he had a huge battle with it, was in, was in bad shape, uh, wanted to be home for Christmas, got out, thought things were looking up, and then he's taking a turn a downturn again is back in the hospital and what's worse uh, given the situation you know his, his wife and his family can't be a while until after the holidays so i'm sending out good vibes to jim valley i know he's going to kick out it too he's going to come back strong um but man I, god guys take it seriously wear a mask i'm not here i don't i don't preach political or whatever else but my god guys just come on follow the science be safe and, and if no other reason be safe for your fellow man and i also of course want to send out my condolences, well wishes to all those who uh, knew and loved Pat Patterson. Uh, Pat was a, a great guy, a great talent, uh, one of the true innovators in professional wrestling, uh, and one of the most influential influential man men in wrestling uh, is the recent history of wrestling, at least. I uh, de you know developed the idea for the Royal Rumble, the first Intercontinental Champion, of course, an on-screen talent as one of the Stooges with Gerald Briscoe, and uh, you know, man, Pat. Everything you see of Pat, all the stories you hear of Pat, is he was just a great guy, right? With a great spirit, uh, had a zest for life, uh, went you know through some uh, unbelievable obstacles that most of us will never realize, and not only in life, uh, but in the world of professional wrestling, and uh, fought through it. And it just man, it, it's so easy to think that when you know someone uh, has the you know has the the, the the what I want to say the obstacles that he would have. Of, of you know the narrow-minded people and, and, and people that are that are you know bigots and, and so on about his lifestyle uh, and his sexual orientation and not only that but you know growing up poor and everything else and, and, and coming to America from another country he had so many obstacles that all signs would indicate you know Pat would have you know wouldn't have been a success right especially not in professional wrestling but he was and not only a success but a huge success uh, and he is truly missed um, you know, one of the greats one of the most influential. Of all time, so uh, hats off, Pat Patterson. We'll we'll miss you, and, and go well. And uh, with that, we're gonna take a break and uh, hear from our sponsor. And when we come back, we will have that interview with Stephen Bell. So stick around. Are you looking for the ultimate stocking stuffers for this holiday season? And look no further because our sponsor Manscaped has the tools to make you win this year's stocking stuffer or white elephant competition. Manscaped is the only brand dedicated to below-the-waist grooming and hygiene products. And great news, 
They just released their products across Europe, Canada, and Australia. I love the Manscaped products. They're great. I use them regularly on a daily basis. I'm excited uh, every day when I get to use these products and groom myself. A few of the products that are prime stocking severs this season are the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. The name speaks for itself. The Crop Reviver Ball Toner, a spray-on toner that will give your balls a little slice of heaven with their aloe vera and hazel extracts. The Crop Cleanser Body Wash, a full body wash that you can also use on your hair. The Crop Mop Ball Wipes. You never know when an opportunity strikes, so you should always be prepared. The Foot Duster Foot Deodorant, designed to keep the stinkiest of feet smelling fresh. And the Shears 2.0 is a luxury four-piece nail kit. You're going to want this in your grooming arsenal. The Weed Whacker Nose and Hair Trimmer, uh, it provides proprietary skin-safe technology to get rid of those nasty nose hairs. This might be my favorite of the Manscaped products. And let's not forget about the best trimmer for your butt, balls, and body. The Lawn Mower 3.0 Trimmer offers a replaceable ceramic blade with advanced skin-safe technology, which helps reduce grooming accidents. These formulations are all vegan, cruelty-free, dye-free, sulfate-free, and paraben-free, so you know their products are legit. And as a listener of the Dave Dynasty Show, you get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with the code DYNASTY20. Again, go to manscaped.com, get 20% off and free shipping by using the code DYNASTY20. So whether this is a gift for your partner, your dad, your brother, your friend, or for yourself, get them something that they will actually use and it's almost sure to get a laugh. Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with the code DYNASTY20. That is D-Y-N-A-S-T-Y-2-0. And be the ballsiest gift giver this year with Manscaped. Our guest today is the author of The Man of All Talents, The Extraordinary Life of Douglas Clark, Stephen Bell. Stephen, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. It's all ours. Uh, well, first, Stephen, uh, we're going to start off here. And uh, for our folks at home who can't tell, uh, <laughs> Stephen here is uh, is from overseas there. So how do you tell us about your background as a wrestling fan growing up in England? Well, well, uh, a wrestling fan growing up in England, we were, my generation were lucky enough, like uh, like most, to have the sort of golden era growing up as kids. We had the uh, the Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, Hero, and then we obviously had um, David Boy Smith, which we cheered on dramatically through that era. And then uh, as we went into the uh, sort of our teenage years of my generation over here, it was the actual era, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. And uh, yeah, it was difficult not to be a wrestling fan uh, in that era, I think, you know. Uh, such, uh, it seems such a long time ago now. Everything's changed so much. The, the wrestling scene's changed so much. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, great times, great memories. What drew you to uh, write a book about Douglas Clark? A, a name that, uh, most likely may not be familiar to uh, many fans. Well, what it was, I'd, I'd wrote one book already. It were a football book, soccer uh, soccer book, as, uh, as you guys would know it, about a Brazilian football team uh, that were involved in a tragic plane crash. Um, so that sort of got me this writing book. It were uh, writing bug. It were really well received. Um, and I actively wanted to do another one, but that being set out in Brazil, I wanted to do something closer to home. Uh, I'm from a... Uh, mining town in the north of England and uh, in the 1980s, well, 70s and 80s, there'd been a, a, uh, a, rugby, a rugby player turned wrestler called Malcolm King Kong Kirk. He uh, died, unfortunately, in the ring in the late 80s wrestling Big Daddy Shirley Crabtree, uh, who you would probably be more aware of. Uh, now, Malcolm was a, a bit of a legend in my village, you know, um, sort of a superstar around there. Everybody that had a Malkirk story. So I set about uh, researching his life, uh, looking to do a biography of him. You know, it might be sort of this tragic comedy where uh, he, he, he'd had such a hilarious life. He, had, he was a happy-go-lucky guy, but met this sort of tragic, really tragic end uh, in the ring. As I was researching that, I, I was following more and more wrestling and rugby um, social media sites. And uh, one day, one of the sites I was following uh, shared a article, a very short article about uh, a gentleman called Doug- Douglas Clark, who was actually f- also from a village close by 
but uh, but well, a century ago, uh, and he he had this most sensational sporting career. Uh, he was one of the greatest and most pioneering rugby players of all time. He went uh, off to war heroics. Uh, like you've never heard of in the First World War. His war diaries are sensational. I went and uh, unearthed them from uh, one of our Imperial War Museums, met with his family. Uh, the most amazing war story I've ever heard. And after that, come, after he'd finished that, he'd got war injuries so uh, so drastic that he was told never to uh, partake in any sport again. But uh, he did. He went back to his rugby career. And then after that uh, was... A pioneer in another sport, the sport of professional wrestling, when it came to our shores in the year 1930, brought over from America, um, where the Gold Dust Trio had, had sort of pioneered it in in the early part of that century. It was becoming a global sport, brought it over here, and Douglas Clark, being this sort of veteran sporting hero and war hero, uh, was sort of lined up to be uh, one of the original practitioners of it in this country took to it like a duck to water as we say uh, it was fantastic at it he had the personality for it uh, and he ended up being our first british heavyweight champion and a recognized world heavyweight champion as well uh, it's a truly amazing story and uh, it was a thrill to research and write about um and you know and you you said it very well you know you talked about um like you said he had a very, pretty remarkable life um like you mentioned from a very young age and uh, in addition to that, like you mentioned, he went to war and everything else. But um, like you mentioned, in addition to that, is that he excelled at wrestling, of course. Um, but you, you have quite a remarkable insight into this man. Um, and you used his journals and writing, kind of like we just mentioned there. But how did you have access to these? Because certainly you have, I would say, the, the deepest insight into somebody who I, quite frankly, have not heard much about. Well, there's very, very little. It, it were it were a completely forgotten story, uh, like a lot of things up here in the north of England. You know, we we're not sort of as recognised as the uh, London-based stories that come out in the media. You know, it, everything's sort of kept a bit more quiet and in-house up here. And uh, it it really did take some uncovering. But when I found out that the Imperial War Museum is his niece is last surviving. A true relative his niece is the curator of uh, all his memorabilia and uh, artifacts and uh, newspaper clippings and she's donated much of that all his all his sporting trophies his war medals she's donated all that to the imperial war museum so i went and did a research uh, session with the imperial war museum made loads of notes took loads of photographs uh, and then went to visit his niece who uh, to uncover the remaining parts of it and now what she had, what she'd kept, what she didn't want to give to the Imperial War Museum uh, was the extra special uh, sentimental stuff which included uh, it, it was actually when he died quite prematurely uh, it was already starting to make some notes with regards to his own uh, writing his own memoirs uh, and she was kind enough to give me access to these which were just fascinating to read on top of that as i say i'd, I'd managed to uncover his war diaries that he'd kept which were uh, harrowing uh, to read so by the time i'd finished with all that and uh, sort of interviewing his niece and one thing of piecing it all together like a jigsaw puzzle uh, it were really amazing but because kayfabe in them days was so absolute that was where the sort of story ended from Douglas Clark's point of view in terms of what he'd left behind. All I had to go on was newspaper clippings, match results, uh, and uh, the kind addition of some interviews with some of our own historians. Uh, managed to piece together that. So the final third of the book, the book's in three parts. The first part is predominantly about his rugby career, the second part about his time at war, and then the third part about his professional wrestling career. Uh, I actually do part three in kayfabe uh, in terms of his uh, his wrestling career because that's all I had to go on. And who, who am I to to break kayfabe on Douglas Clark? We, um, no, nobody did back then. Uh, wow. So I, I certainly wasn't in a position to do that. So I wrote the story as I felt he told it back then. There, there's definitely a sense of honor and kind of, you know, keeping those wishes of the old days. Um but it was certainly, you know, being able to have these resources gave a, a whole new depth to the book. And it's pretty incredible because it's almost like you could have written three separate books about each of his lives. You know, the war hero, the rugby player and then the wrestler. 
Uh, well, I'll be honest. I was very dubious when I started my research as to whether this was the same Douglas Clark. I thought, am I going to make a complete fool of myself and <laughs> get halfway through get halfway through this book and then interview some historian who says, don't be silly, that's not all the same person? Because it didn't feel possible that this man could have uh, achieved the pinnacle and had these stories to tell in three separate fields. I mean, you could even almost count the fourth, um, which was his career in the very legitimate wrestling background uh his regional style of cumberland and westmoreland wrestling which was sort of what he was the world champion at that in 1930 which when um professional wrestling came to these shows and they were getting together um all the best practitioners of all the different regional styles of wrestling that is why he got one of the main reasons he got invited to partake uh, because he was the world champion at that as well uh hence the name uh the man of all talents is uh the, I, I'm from a town called Huddersfield and um, he, Huddersfield was the rugby team he played for. They had a clean sweep of all the trophies available to him just before the First World War broke out and they were they were known as the team of all talents. They sort of pioneered uh, new ways and new entertaining styles of play. They were like the Harlem Globetrotters uh, and he were a main player in that. Uh, so it's a bit of a play on words. The man of all talents uh, is a playing words of that team's name, nickname, and also the fact that he seemingly could put his hand to anything, including uh, his, his lovely writing that he left behind for me to uncover 100 years later. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and to kind of dive into that a little bit, obviously, you know, you, you, you did quite a bit of legwork to, to get to that point to where you could get those writings and, you know, be able to uh, use that as part of your story to tell his story, if you will. Um, but I, I have to say, you know, you ha- obviously had to approach his living family and re- living relative uh, in regards to getting access to those. What did they think about you writing a book about him? Oh, she was thrilled. And of all the I mean, it's it's been re- fantastically received. I've had some wonderful reviews. Uh, it's really heartwarming. The things that people say not about my writing, you know, this will never be my story. It's, uh, I might have authored the book, but um, this will always be Douglas Clark's story, not mine. Uh, and it's really heartwarming to people have almost thanked me for uncovering this uh, this fantastic story that time had sort of left behind. Uh, but the best sort of most heartwarming review I got of them all was from his niece Elizabeth, who was just thrilled. Um, it, it actually made uh, we have Remembrance Day over here in November, which um, would be the equivalent of Veterans Day. Uh, in the US and it actually made the story and the book made national press uh, as a lot of the national newspapers ran with this as one of their sort of lead um, Remembrance Day stories so on top of the on top of the book which I think encapsulates his story brilliantly and um, so cements his legacy a little bit he got he got truly remembered on a national scale uh, and she's very grateful for that and it, it means a lot to me that she's happy with the happy with the book and how it's turned out and definitely, like you said, I mean, there's there's no better review than the the review of the the family that he left behind, and um, certainly um, to even kind of follow that train of thought, you know, uh, Clark died, you know, relatively young at the age of 59, um, but there are even stories of his extraordinary strength, you know, and his extraordinary will up until his final years, weren't there? Oh yeah, I mean, there were no such thing as sort of a world's strongest man competition back then, but everybody who uh, who either played rugby with him or wrestled with him, you know, in, in two sports where you've got these extreme, extremely strong men, uh, everybody who played with him or against him or wrestled with him or against him, uh, swore that he was the strong, the world's strongest man. Uh, he developed that, he developed that through, um, his upbringing with his dad, who was a coal delivery man, uh, delivering sacks of coal as a young man and just naturally gaining this strength and speed uh, as he ran up and down the streets with his huge sacks of coal. Uh, and yet he, he went back to that late in his life to serve his community. Uh, after he retired from his sport, he, he went back and oh, ran his own coal delivery firm during the Second World War, uh, just so that he could keep keep the warmth into his uh, in his local community during that time of need. And, and certainly, you know, we, we've talked so far about the, his legacy. You know, he, he had so much that he had done, you know, from rugby to World War and to his wrestling. Um, but kind of from our conversation, I almost wonder, um, 
Because do you feel like Clark is most remembered as a rugby player um, and his wrestling accomplishments being overlooked? Or do you feel that uh, he's also remembered for that wrestling? Um, but from the conversation we've had, I, I have a feeling that the wrestling part's somewhat not well as well remembered, if that makes sense. I, from a British sporting point of view, I think it is rugby, I think, is what um, most people who, who do remember him or do have knowledge of his achievements. Uh, I think the rugby is what I'd spring to mind to start with. On, on a global scale, I mean, he went and did us tours of Australia with his wrestling and really spread that sport at a time when it needed it. You know, it was very much a fledgling sport. Uh, and what he did for the world... Uh, sort of globalization of of that sport I, I, you just can't be overlooked and that is why in the book what i did was split it up into three equal parts of very equal lengths uh, because i couldn't have been researched him so much between the rugby the war and the wrestling i didn't feel it was fair to give any one of them um i didn't want it to be a, a rugby biography i didn't want it to be a war biography i didn't want it to be a wrestling biography i wanted to give each three each of them three achievements that he had in his life uh, uh, equal standing within the book because it is very difficult to separate them as i say it's uh, it's amazing that he managed to achieve such things in across three different spheres i was going to say i you know in, in my lifetime i will be lucky to have even a moderate or a modicum of accomplishment in even one field and you know it's pretty incredible to see somebody with his level of talent have that you know extreme i would say uh success in so many fields and you know and one last thing I wanted to ask, because, you know, certainly with your biography, it's one of those things where um, you have such a unique character, right? You know, he, he presents himself in such a unique way with his uh, successes and everything else. Um, but we are also at the disadvantage of seeing this in retrospect, like you said, almost a century later. Um, what did you feel were, were the biggest challenges about writing this book? you know, in retrospect, about someone who did pass away almost 70 years ago. I think the most challenging side of it was also kind of the most thrilling to to almost transport myself back uh, in time. I sort of immersed myself in the story that much that, uh, you know, I, I think we all sort of love a, a good period drama or um, a, a book that takes you back in time. And I, I was kind of able to do that with my research and um, through all the all the books that I read and uh, people that I spoke to, uh, it it really it, it was challenging to do that because we're living such a different age now. But um, it, I think from a from a personal point of view, it, it gave me such an insight into life back then, especially in these the small mining towns uh, that I'm from that have that have changed so much over the years. Uh, so yeah, it was very that side of it was very challenging, but also probably the most rewarding. Wow. So I, I got to say, it's been so wonderful talking to you and definitely uh, getting a chance to speak with you has definitely piqued my interest. And I hope it's piqued our listeners interest as well to, you know, take a gander at this book. And uh, for the just to kind of remind the folks out there, the book is called The Man of All Talents, The Extraordinary Life of Douglas Clark by Stephen Bell. Um, now, Stephen, if you can tell our listeners, how can they get a copy of your book if they want to give it a give it a shot? Uh, it's published by Pitch Publishing, uh, the sport, uh, the UK's biggest sports book publisher. Uh, but it's available online. Uh, certainly, Amazon being the global retailer of choice, uh, it's available in the US and Canada and beyond. Um, and yeah, I'd urge everybody to go and have a look, uh, take a take a look. It's uh, it's a completely unique story. Um, I, I was thrilled to stumble across it. I was lucky to stumble across it. As I say, this will always be Douglas Clark's story, not mine. But, yeah, it's uh, a fantastic story. Yeah. Um, that being said, you know, it's been wonderful talking about uh, Douglas Clark's story. But um, we've heard that you already have planned um, your next project, uh, that you have an announcement to make exclusively here on the Dave Dines Show. I know you have actually started start on it already. Um, it'll be my third book. And uh, as your listeners might be able to tell from my accent, I am from a, a small northern mining town uh, in England. And it's about an hour's drive away from another small mining town, uh, that of Goldbourne near Wigan. Now, a couple of, uh, about 60 years ago, a pair of cousins were born there. They were Tom Billington and David Boy Smith. Uh, as we all know, they went on to be the Dynamite Kid and the British Bulldog. Uh, they went on to have such amazing, fantastic, legendary careers and much storied lives. Uh, they both tragically died 
uh, early as well, a bit like Douglas Clark did. Um, that was predominantly due to their sort of live fast, die young uh, attitude throughout the careers, uh, which were just for our entertainment. They were so fantastic at what they did. Uh, I truly believe their story needs telling in book form. Uh, it never really has. Um, Dynamite Kid released a, a short biography um, shortly before he died. Uh, David Boy Smith died so young that he never got a chance to tell his story. Uh, I've started research and I've started writing on the book I'm going to call Dynamite and Davy, The Explosive Lives of the British Bulldogs. And uh, yeah, I'm sort of going to start appealing out to wrestlers and wrestling fans and friends and family of them from that era uh, for added research and any anecdotes and information that they'd like, that they think would be suitable for the book. Um, I think it, I think the sort of world, the wrestling world, is due this book, uh, and it'll be much needed and much loved. And I feel that uh, in my position now, sort of a, a really passionate sports writer, I could put me sort of myself in their position from being this, from the same part of the world. Uh, and yeah, I just feel that the time is right, and I'm the right person to to take over this project and have a look into it. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm very excited to hear that as well. Um, of course, that's super exciting news for any fans, um, you know, who, like you said, you know, their their story is one that really hasn't been told. So, you know, certainly that is a very exciting project. But um, that being said, Stephen, how can listeners follow you on social media so they can stay up to date on your new project? Uh, I mainly use my Twitter page for all my uh, writing uh, profile things so uh, i am Stephen, Stephen with a v Stephen underscore bell 1985 uh, be easy enough to find me through uh through your own uh profile and yeah please give me a follow and especially if you've got if you if you'd like to keep up to date with all things uh dynamite and davy and especially if you think you might be able to contribute to my research it'd be great thank you very much absolutely all right, everybody. Um, you have heard the story not only of, um, of not only of, of Douglas Clark, but you also have heard the story of his next project. Uh, we know what Stephen Bell is going to be up to moving forward. So, you know, definitely go out there and, uh, you know, order a copy of the book for yourself and grab one as a gift for a wrestling fan in your life. And of course, Stephen, thanks again for joining us. And we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with, uh, with Dave to wrap up this episode of the Dave Dynasty Show. If you are looking for the best books, DVDs, and posters on classic wrestling nostalgia, then you want to visit crowbarpress.com. There are literally dozens of titles there, including biographies of the likes of Bruiser Brody, Ole Anderson, Ivan Koloff, and of course, Dick the Bruiser, as we've spoke about here on the Dave Dynasty Show. You want to visit crowbarpress.com for all of your classic wrestling nostalgia needs. Again, that is crowbarpress.com. All right. Thank you for joining us for the Dave Dynasty Show. Uh, thank you for listening to that interview. Thank you to Stephen Bell for coming on, uh, talking about his book and his upcoming project. A, a book on the British Bulldogs. How exciting is that? I cannot wait uh, for that book to be finished and to read that book. Thank you to Ike Isaacs for conducting that interview for the Dave Dynasty Show. As always, uh, guys, we got a lot of great stuff coming up in the future for the Dave Dynasty Show. Uh, lots of interviews with with a lot of past legends uh, that I've got lined up uh, in the works. Lots of people wanting to come on the show, willing to come on the show. I cannot wait to talk to some of these people. Uh, some great interviews lined up for the Ring of Ding Dong Dandy Stampede Wrestling Podcast. Of course, uh, lots of talent from the Midwest and around uh, the, the the world that we like to talk to. We're going to dig into some some deep stories, some uh, events, really dive into a lot of history after the holidays and after the new year. Uh, we will have Vincent Berry on to talk uh, soon about his book, Lance by Chance, the story of Lance Von Erich. It's a, a very cool book, a very cool story. He will be on uh, in the near future uh, to talk about that. Uh, it, it's just great. we got lots of great stuff coming up for the Dave Dynasty Show, so make sure you hit the subscribe button uh, so that you do not miss an episode. Uh, again, make sure you look us up on all the social media platforms. Uh, you know, Twitter, I'm very active on Twitter, so check me out there. It's at the Dave Dynasty. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for all your support. Uh, coming up soon is the holidays, and what we were gonna, are going to do is I'm going to re-release uh, the episode that we did on the WWA Indianapolis Christmas shows. Uh, it's a very, very cool episode. I, I did a lot of research looking into it. We're talking about these Christmas shows. We're going to re-release that episode, 
And I'm very excited about that. And also, make sure you follow us, like I said, on Twitter and on Facebook, because there I will also, in conjunction with that, re-release all the newspaper clippings from the show, the ads, the results, the stories, so that you get the full scope of what these shows were like. Uh, So anyway, uh, that episode is coming up uh, on holiday week. Until then, wherever you go, whatever you do, be good, be safe, and keep on growing.